want to speak to you today who do you think you are who do you think you are numbers 13 33 says we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them the amplified said we were like grasshoppers in our own sight so we were in their sight now you and I know that if you know the story and we're going to go into it that was a total distortion but fear magnified the situation and they saw themselves as weak they had a negative opinion of themselves and it's been said that 85 percent of all our problems stems from the way we view ourselves there's a quote it says we are addicted to our thoughts we cannot change anything unless we change our thinking so I'm gonna ask you just to put your hands on your head as though we're placing them on the mind on our mind we've been given the mind of Christ father today let the Word of God penetrate penetrate let this day be the day where we would start the sword of the Spirit to penetrate and demolish all these things that come against us in our minds in the name of Jesus amen and amen in Numbers 13 where I quoted from this is a very familiar passage of Scripture there were these 12 spies 12 leaders uh, 12 princes of their tribes 12 men of distinction they were sent out by God to explore the land that God has promised and that's why we call it the promised land and at this juncture this is supposed to be Israel's shining moment they are on the cusp of greatness they're about to fulfill their destiny they were brought out of bondage out of the world power Egypt to be brought into a new land and of course that is symbolic that's typology we were brought out of our old land we were brought out of darkness to be brought into the new land that God has for us brought into a land of freedom in Christ now a little history I love history I love to know why the Bible talks about what led up to these circumstances so as I said the Israelites they were living in Egypt which was the world power for 435 years 14 generations generation after generation was born into slavery and the mentality of slavery was etched in the DNA of their mind and according to the world power they were looked down upon as inferior they felt like they were uh, bugs that could be stepped on at any time and then God sends Moses and he's a deliverer he's a type of Christ to bring them out from underneath this oppression into this new land that God had promised them and by miraculous intervention a million plus people leave their old life and God splits a sea and that's a type of the blood and he drowns their enemies right behind them they see this miracle with their own eyes this should have erased any doubt that would ever cause them to think God is not for them and God is not with them and they end up in a desert not because they took a wrong turn but the desert was a necessary pit stop it's between the old land and the new land there's always a desert experience it's where you get your spiritual footing if you're a new believer you know that when you get saved it's like okay what do I do now how do I talk uh, how do I dress I mean I came out of the world I was crazy I was always in clubs I didn't have Christian clothes 
I mean, I had to throw everything basically out. But I didn't know how to dress normal. I never dressed normal. I lived at night to go to clubs. I had crazy clothes, crazy thinking. So we're brought into this desert experience, and it's like our spiritual gym. It's where we get our spiritual uh, footing, so to speak. It's a blank canvas because now God is going to rewrite the sequel to our lives. In other words, he's going to write volume two. But the point is we can't stay in the desert. We got to get out of the desert. And in the desert, they were brought to impossible and impassable circumstances, only to show them that nothing is impossible and nothing is impossible, right? You know the story, Red Sea, no problem. I'll turn it into a road, no water, no problem. I'll get water from a huge water tank, no food, no problem. I deliver right to your door, too hot, no problem. I'll be a a, a, a cloud by day to cold, no problem. I'll be a pillar of fire by night. And by Numbers 13, they were in the desert for 15 months, even though it was an 11 day journey, supposed to be an 11 day journey, but it was 15 months. And now God is saying it's time to move on. It was time for them to move on, even though in those 15 days, they had a lot of incidents, but God still wanted them to go forward. They had the golden calf incidents. I want, to, want you to see if you see the typology in that. They get tired of waiting for Moses, so they take matters into their own hands. Then they had the grumbling against the manna. The manna was too bland. They missed the spices of Egypt. Then they had the grumbling against the water. The water was just a little bit too bitter for them. They didn't like the taste. It wasn't sweet enough. Sometimes we read the water of God's word and it's a little bitter. We don't like that. Then they had the grumbling against uh, Moses, against the leadership incidents. But God still wants them to go forward. And in this desert, God wants them to know that he can be trusted emphatically. He was teaching them to walk by faith, not by sight, not by their feelings. So I'm going to read Numbers 13, 25 to 33. It will be on the screen. It says, at the end of 40 days, because they scouted out the land for 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there, they're powerful. And the cities are fortified and large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and Amorites. They live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. So in other words, everywhere they went in this promised land that was vast, there was an enemy. Okay, and it was enemies they never saw before because in Egypt, their enemy uh, was the Egyptians who oppressed them. And in the desert, they had other situations, but there were no giants in the desert. But now they're being brought into this promised land and they're facing what they've never faced before. Everywhere they went, if they went by the sea, if they went by the mountains, there was some ice waiting for them. But the men who had gone up with him said, oh, I'm sorry, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. 
But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devour those living in it. All the people we saw are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. Now, when I noticed this, I had never noticed this before, there is not one mention of God from 10 of the spies. What do they say? We can't do it. And they acted as though Moses sent them as it was Moses' idea for them to go into the promised land. But it wasn't Moses' idea. God sent them. So they say, we can't, uh, we are not able. And yet Caleb says, we are well able. Now, Caleb's we was God and us. We, we can do it. Uh, uh, Numbers 14, 24, it says, Caleb had a different spirit. He wholeheartedly served the Lord. So in other words, anything Caleb did totally included God in this situation. Caleb knew God was sending him. So he's ba basically saying, we are well able to take it. We shouldn't even be thinking about it. Come on, let's, let's go. Let's get on with it. Joshua and Caleb are the only two that believe, but 10 did not. Their doubt and fear caused them to magnify the problem and minimize God. And let me just say this, doubt and fear, they're cousins. They always travel together. So 10 saw obstacles, two saw opportunities. 10 saw problems, two saw possibilities. 10 saw giants, two saw gigantic grapes. 10 saw burdens, two saw blessings. 10 were fear stricken, two were fearless. Here they see the same land, but at a totally different point of view, a totally different POV. Even though they had physical proof, they're carrying around these huge cluster of grapes. It took two men to carry them on their shoulders. But unfortunately, as they're carrying the proof, they're carrying around this gigantic sense of fruitlessness on their back. Their past was present with them. It wasn't the giants without, it was the giant within. And I say this often, great things can happen to you, but unless they happen in you, they won't change you. 38 years later in the book of Joshua, Joshua again ends up sending two spies. He doesn't send 12 because he realized we shouldn't get so many opinions. He gets two men filled with faith to go into the promised land and they meet Rahab, who was a prostitute, who ends up becoming a believer. She's even in the line of Jesus. And when Rahab meets these two spies, she said, oh my goodness, we heard about the Red Sea. We're shaking in our boots. We are terrified of you. So their fears were totally unfounded. But because of the way they saw themselves, but because of the way they saw themselves, they assumed everyone else saw them as grasshoppers. Who do you think you are? I'm going to give you grasshopper facts. I have the Encyclopedia Britannica, the whole volume. So I studied, and I want you to see how they saw themselves. Fact number one, grasshoppers travel in large numbers with other grasshoppers, but serve absolutely no purpose. Scientists are baffled by their very existence. Their numbers are so vast they obscure the sun. Two, grasshoppers are relatively useless and destructive. They ravage the land without replenishing it. They take, but they don't give. Three, 
they have an unusual habit of eating each other instead of eating other insects. They eat their own kind. Four, they are the chief target of other insects and animals. Five, when being attacked, instead of fighting back, they react by having no movement, frozen in fear, they blend into their surroundings, even though they have the capability to jump onto higher ground and use their strong jaw to bite back. Six, the grasshopper's ears are in their bellies. This allows them to feel the vibrating of other grasshoppers and respond to their chirps and just do what everyone around them is doing. Can we see the typology in this? When we have a grasshopper mentality, we are relatively purposeless. We are massive in numbers, but we do nothing to contribute to our surroundings. We just basically take up space and obscure the sun, the sun. We tend to bite and devour one another. When attacked, we blend in instead of jumping onto higher ground and use God's word to take a bite out of the enemy's lies. We follow the chirps of the crowd. But this is the kicker. All types of filthy flies filled with bacteria lay their eggs on the grasshopper's back and hatch their young. The baby flies eat their way through, eating the grasshopper alive, and the grasshopper just sits there and takes it and allows it to happen. Is that just not like uh, the enemy who hatches his filthy lies on our backs, and we sit there and we allow it to happen? Numbers 14, 3, it says, why has the Lord brought us out? to this land. All of a sudden, they're including God, right? Before, there's no mention of God. They feel like they're all alone, but now they're including God, and they're blaming God who loves them, who delivered them, who had a new land for them to possess. They said, why has the Lord brought us to this land? To fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Deuteronomy 1.32. And just so you know in your own Bible uh, reading that Deuteronomy and Numbers, they're cousins. There's repeats maybe from a different point of view. And I, it, it says this. We're not going to put it on, this, on the screen because I'm going to reference it. He says, in spite of all this, in spite of all this, in spite of the mercy, the kindness, the patience, the grace, the love, in spite of all this, you did not trust the Lord who went ahead of you on the journey. All God wanted to do in that desert was to get them to trust them. So I started to study what is that in human nature that causes us to act like this. In psychotherapy, a, psych, a psychiatrist, his name is Dr. Aaron T. Beck, began to detect a pattern amongst his patients. It had to do with the way they interpreted events. The interpretation was so negative that it was damaging to their self-respect. It was fatalistic. It was as if they thought themselves into a condition that was later termed learned helplessness. Do you hear what I'm saying? They thought themselves into a condition that was later termed learned helplessness. It had to do with the way they talked to themselves. They kept telling themselves, I'm a failure, I'm stupid, I'm an idiot, I'll never succeed, I'll never accomplish anything, I'm useless, things will never change. 
and the thoughts became so automatic that it was their knee-jerk reaction, it was their default, whatever situation they were put in, if it was a good situation or a bad situation. And the thing is that they, they discovered that because the thoughts were so automatic, those thoughts would absolutely overshadow anything positive that had happened. That's how strong the negative thinking was. It was so automatic that they couldn't even remember anything good that happened, even though many good things did happen. So think about this. The 10 spies literally thought themselves out of their victory. They thought themselves out of their victory. And because they viewed life through a negative lens, they automatically assumed everyone else saw them in the same negative light that they saw themselves. Remember, the way they saw themselves was the sole reason for their defeat. 40 years in the desert, the sole reason for their defeat because of the way they saw themselves. So this doctor thought, if I can get them to become conscious of their thoughts, they could see how unjustified their thoughts are. This is where we get uh, cognitive behavioral ther therapy, being cognizant of what we're thinking. In other words, if they're gonna become healthy, they must challenge the lie. The lie has to be challenged. Now, long before Dr. Beck ever thought of this theory, God did. God knew those lies we tell ourselves must be exposed. They must be challenged. So he gives us a spiritual prescription to fight the battle because these are spiritual enemies. Let me just tell you, you are not thinking those thoughts. The enemy is thinking those thoughts. That's what the enemy does. His job is to feed you negativity, doubt, fear, anxiousness, low self-esteem, because he doesn't want you to get up in the morning and remember what God has done for you. He wants you to dwell on what can't be. And spiritual enemies call for spiritual weapons. So Romans 12, 2 says, be transformed. It's a command by renewing your mind. This scripture is challenging us to challenge the lies by holding up what we think against God's truth. What we think against God's truth. The word transform means to make a thorough or dramatic change in appearance. Renew means to renovate back to its original purpose. So let me say this, negative thinking is automatic, but a transformed mind is not automatic. There's no abracadabra. There's no magic formula. The word fairy isn't going to sprinkle word dust in your mind while you're sleeping or watching TV. No, it's, it's work. It's a process. It's a process. It's recognizing your thoughts, rejecting the lie. That's what we talk about, taking the thought captive. You make the thought the prisoner. You don't make the thought make you the prisoner. It's recognizing your thoughts, rejecting the lie, and replacing them with the truth of God's word. So the process is recognize, reject, replace. Let's say that. Recognize, reject, and replace. So instead of viewing life through the lens of our woundedness, what happened to me 48 years ago, 
my trauma, my perception, my preferences. We're going to choose to view ourselves and God and, 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 and others through the lens of who God says we are, through the lens of who God says he is. See, if you don't hold up the word of God, you can have a very negative view of God. You could be like the Israelites that blame God. I was better off when. We have to read the Word of God. And I don't know about you, but when I don't read the Word of God, I'm not talking about a quick verse. I'm talking about reading. It could be one scripture, but meditating on it, chewing on it, getting it in my heart. I am missing something, totally. I feel empty. I have nothing to give out. But when I'm in the Word of God, the Word of God activates everything else I know about God. And what happens? Rivers of living water come out of your mouth. So I'm no longer going to operate from my soulish mind, which is how I, I operated before I was a Christian. And here's the truth, unless we renew our minds, we will continue to walk in defeat, struggle and confusion. Even though we love the Lord, even though we desire a spirit-filled life, even though we go to church, wanting it is not enough. God's word must be applied. It must be applied. My friend put this on Instagram this week. Her name is Karina. She says, you've got to faith it till you make it. How many oftentimes you take the word of God and, and you put it against what you're thinking and you almost feel like a hypocrite? Because you're like, you don't really feel like that. You feel like a failure. God says, I am above and not beneath. I'm the head and not the tail, but I, don't, I feel like the tail. So I feel like a hypocrite. But you got to faith it till you make it. Let every man be a liar. God's word is true. Jeremiah 23, 29. I love this scripture. It says, is not my word a fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer, like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Now, God isn't talking about the hammer, a household hammer. He's talking about a sledgehammer. God's word is like a sledgehammer that shatters boulders. It's the sledgehammer has the potential to do a lot of demolishing and damage, but it has to be picked up and used. We must pick up the sledgehammer of God's word to demolish those arguments. Break those walls of cement that are keeping us from seeing what God sees. I want to tell you a story. I bought my house in, uh, we bought our house in 1977, $65,000. We're being buried in the backyard because where are we going to go? Anyway, great house, but for 30 years, now I'm in my house 48 years, for the first 30 years, we always had an issue. We had this leak in our dining room ceiling, which came from above where the shower was. So I've had every expert come and tell me what's wrong and how to fix this. So the first expert comes and he says, you know, you just have the, it, it just needs to be grouted. So of course we get the grout and the expert does it, not us. We are not those people. Anything breaks in my house, we have a bungee cord and masking tape. Just so you know, I had stuff coming in through the window. The window was cockeyed. There's masking tape on that window. So anyway, I don't want you to think like I, it's the basement window, okay. Got to get a fist. So anyway, um, we, we get it grouted. A few months later, 
you know, we paint, we repatch, and a few months later, there's the stain again. So another expert comes and tells me, no, no, it's the fixtures. You gotta change the fixtures. So we gotta break the tile, put new fixtures, retile, paint, repatch. A few months later, there it is. It's the lead pan. It's the lead pan. You gotta break up the floor. You gotta break up the floor of the shower. You gotta get a new lead pan. There it is. So this is it. This is it. A few months later, the lead pan isn't tipped right. You gotta tip the lead pan. You gotta tip it. Break it up. Tip the pan. Paint. Repatch. A few months later. Oh, yeah. So we end up inheriting money. My mean cousin Rose, thank you, Jesus, the only good thing she ever did. <laughs> she gave me money. Which she donated all her money to the Catholic Church, but she gave me enough money to put in a new bathroom. So of course, what do we do? We take the bathtub out and we put this huge shower. It's like a virtual water park. You know, the huge shower head, you know, the handheld, the jets, you know, not me. I only use the handheld. My husband's in there. He thinks he's in great adventure. So <laughs> there he is. This is it. A few months later, guess what? Yes. So I called the plumber, and the plumber says, the, pe the bathroom people, call Roto-Rooter. Away goes trouble down the, down the drain. But guess what? Away didn't go trouble down the drain. Because a few months later, yes, paint it, repatch it, paint it, repatch it. All of a sudden, the bathroom people say to us, well, you know what? Maybe you shouldn't use all the jets at the same time. So I'm in the bathroom like, am I wet yet? And now the, the, the shower is filling up like a bathtub. So we come home from church one Sunday and our whole ceiling collapsed. From so many times of patching, repatching, patching, repatching. So now here I am in the dining room with Hans the plumber. And now we're looking up. And this is what we discover. These are our old pipes. Put that first one back. My new pipes were connected to my old pipes. So when the water started to flow, it met with resistance because this was filled like a wall of cement. So it had no other choice to go except to leak out. So I have this epiphany. I realize that my old pipes are like my old life. It's the old me, it's my old mind, it's my old nature. So I come to church and I get filled with the Word of God. Show the beautiful pipe. Yes, the Word of God, it flows, it flows, it flows. But then it's met with my old nature and it has no choice but to leak out. That's why on Sunday we're super superheroes, but by Wednesday we're like, Can I do all things through? Is God for me? So what has to happen? This is what happened in my house. Those pipes had to be cleaned. They had to be renovated. They had to be drilled through. They had to be all of the, and it took time. It didn't happen overnight. We've got to take the sledgehammer of God's word to clean out our old pipes. Those old pipes that tell me I'm not good enough. I don't belong. I'm an idiot. I'm stupid. 
I'm the exception to the rule. God loves everyone else in the building except you. You know those thoughts. I want to end with a true story. The pipes were a true story too. I was invited to do a conference in Texas, but I was invited uh, many years ago to be the morning speaker. I wasn't the main speaker. And if I tell you who the two evening speakers were, you would absolutely know their names. They're giants, giants in the faith, you know, world known. So they're looking for a morning speaker, you know, a little morning speaker. And someone in the church says, wow, have you ever heard Mama Maria? So they call me up and I say, okay. But then when we're landing and I get into the car, I'm with Penny, I am crippled. I, I can't even tell you, I was paralyzed with fear. I'm thinking to myself, what in the world did I do? Why did I say yes to this? I don't, I don't belong here. I don't fit in with these other people. So we get to the hotel. I, I, I am panic stricken. Penny says, Ree, what's wrong with you? I've never seen you like this. I couldn't even express the fear that I had. So they come and they pick us up and now we're in the church, we're in the green room with so-and-so and so-and-so. And I, I'm not myself, I, you know, I'm just in the corner. I'm, I'm just like this and my knees are knocking and my only solace is that I'm gonna do the morning ser service so these people, they don't go to the morning service. So now I'm in the worship service and I'm between them. I, I could hardly open my mouth to worship. And all of a sudden, the woman pastor who's heading the conference, she said, she taps me on the shoulder, she says, listen, before so-and-so gets up to speak, I would love for you to go up there and give a little synopsis of what you're saying tomorrow because, you know, they don't usually come out for the morning service. So now I'm, I was about to collapse. I am not kidding you. I, I was so frightened. I can't even tell you the terror that I felt. But all of a sudden, I don't know what happened, but I said, wait a minute. God, I didn't call myself here. I don't even have a card because somebody knew Mama Maria. I said, you called me here, God, and whom you call, you equip. So God, right now, I am expecting the equipment of heaven to give me a thought of what I am supposed to say. And he does, in a moment's notice. You see, the fear left, I called on God, God comes in and everything changed. So I get up and I give this little synopsis that the woman the, got up and she was like, wow. The next morning, full house, packed. Wait, it gets better. They take a, a survey to every woman that went to the conference. What did you like the best? Hands down, I unanimously. We love Maria Durso. Imagine, imagine the next two years they had me do the conference alone, even though they've always had very, very famous people. Listen, listen, those thoughts will always crop up. That's why you always need to read the word. They will always crop up. Those thoughts, they're like roaches. If you see one, you know there's a whole family behind the wall. But what makes roaches flee? Turn the light on. When you turn the light on, you watch them run for cover. Listen, the word is a lamp.
Psalm 119, 105. It's living and active, Hebrews 4, 12. It lasts forever, Isaiah 48. It's perfect and flawless, Psalm 1830. It's right and true, Psalm 33, 4. It's powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword, Hebrews 4, 12. It demolishes strongholds, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. It's a fire, shut up in my bones, Jeremiah 29. We are to crave it like a new born baby, 1 Peter 2.2. 2. So I ask you today, who do you think you are? It's found in the Word of God. Listen, I'm not who I think I am. I'm not who I think I am. I'm not who you think I am. I'm not even who I think you think I am. I am who He says I am.